work in the research lab and with all my colleagues in the department. So I really am very blessed and fortunate to have such a wonderful experience here. Uh, and I also want to thank you all for attending, and hopefully this will be a, a good talk. So today uh, I'll talk about some of my dissertation work, and this is entitled The Spectroscopy and Photophysics of Isolated Prebiotic Nuclear Bases. So, uh, so in my mind, there's probably no better field or more exciting field to talk about than the origins of life and maybe where we came from. And so I was thinking about how to put this talk, talk together, and what better way to start than at the very beginning, literally. So this is a timeline of events pertaining to the early history and life on Earth. And this is a figure that Joe Joyce published in Nature a few years back. And I really like it. But the, uh, the dates here that are in billions of years are only approximate dates. So it's debatable on what timeline happened. But conceptually, people agree on this, on this timeline of events. So approximately about 4.56 billion years ago, the Earth has formed. And hundreds of millions of years later, things kind of settled down and stabilized on the Earth. And along those lines, of from about 4.6 to arguably about 3.8, but basically in the early evolution of the Earth, there's a lot of impact events of meteorites and comets constantly bombarding the Earth, which may have brought really essential molecules of life, and especially water. And so uh, there's one way of getting prebiotic-like molecules on the Earth. And then there's another, that the Earth is forming them on themselves. But the problem is, is life doesn't happen with just simple molecules. It's much, much more complex. It's actually incredibly complex. And along the lines, these things developed until you get to, I'm going to kind of skip back and mention this a little bit later. You'll get back to here, where all of life, as we know it, are based on really two things. It's DNA, which we use our, as our genetic material and also proteins, which function as catalysts and enzymes and do a variety of different functions. But to think of how those things developed, again, is highly complex. And so we kind of think back of how maybe they could have developed. And so it goes back to a time period which is called the RNA world, which is actually a hypothetical world that's based on that RNA is used instead of DNA as the first biomacromolecule. Uh, and this was really supported later on, much later on in the 1980s on the discovery that RNA actually has catalytic ability itself. And this was a major breakthrough and it actually resulted in the Nobel Prize for Sidney Altman and Thomas Cech in 1989. And so when you have this special molecule that's tied up in say an RNA molecule which is built up nucleobases. So that's where you're going from some sort of prebiotic like nucleobase to a macromolecule to the more complex RNA and maybe you start the early evolutions of life and then it branches off. We know this happens because we're all sitting here at the seminar today. So my talk is going to be focusing more on the small molecules and the prebiotic chemistry. So you can't really start talking about prebiotic chemistry without addressing really uh, the father of prebiotic chemistry. So a little bit of my talk is going to be on the background. And that's Stanley Miller. This is actually Stanley Miller 28, leaves, 28 years later. He's a little bit older, but he was a grad student uh, when he did this work, and it was published in Science in 1953, which was actually a very exciting time period in science, because this is around the time that Watson and Crick unraveled the mysteries of DNA. So there's lots of interesting things that go from chemistry to biology. And so what he did was, is he's standing in front of this very famous apparatus, uh, and you might be familiar with the Milliuri experiment, in which he took very simple precursor molecules, like methane, ammonium, water, hydrogen, and basically a reducing atmosphere, uh, which would be a simulated prebiotic ocean that would come up and evaporate and then go through into a spark discharge right here, which would simulate lightning on a primitive Earth. And then things would condense out, come through, and fill this V tube. And after a week, the solution became this blackish brown complex tar. And when he analyzed them, he got something back really fantastic, and he got back amino acids. And it was one of the first demonstrations shown that you can take simple precursors that are abiotic and go to a biologically important molecule that's necessary for life. And so, <clears throat> one of the other things too is, is this really opened our eyes. We don't want to keep closed-minded at the same time. So this happened on Earth, but could this happen on other places? You know, this idea of if you have these readily available molecules, you could actually have this on other planets or elsewhere. I mean, the universe is a gigantic place. So it really thinks our mindset for maybe there is life outside of our own planet. Uh, so I talked about amino acids being essential for proteins. 
the building blocks for our DNA and RNA are nucleobases. And so you would think that there would be some sort of prebiotic pathway to form nucleobases. And this is just one example by taking a simple nitrogen molecule called form amide and keeping it at elevated temperatures on a titanium dioxide surface. And this actually works really well. It's really robust in that you can substitute this with, say, montmorillonite clays, which is a very prebiotic clay that's really popular, or mineral surfaces, and you can vary this. But what's important is you can get back the biologically relevant of the used nucleobases. So you get both purines, which are these two, cytosine and thymine, which are one ring structures with nitrogen in them. And you also get back adenine, which is a purine, which is two ring structures. So it's a six member ring with a five member ring. And this is called an indole structure. And it's also with nitrogen heterocyclic. And you get these back. But the other thing is this chemistry is not always so uh, straightforward. And you get back a whole host of other things, like this. Uh, but what's interesting, we start looking into the re reactions a little bit di uh, deeper and looking at these products, you see something like this. This molecule right here is called 5-hydroxymethyluracil. It is actually found today in the DNA of bacteriophages. And so you get this occurrence that happens a lot, that you see these unusual nucleobases show up in modern biology. And it could it be basically ancient vestiges of an RNA world or a prebiotic soup that might have came forth. But the thing that's important is, is that Biology uses five bases, adenine, uh, guanine, cytosine, thymine, and uracil, and only five predominantly. And there really is no explanation of why it's so simple in just those five bases. When you can have a whole host of other possible potential molecules that can participate. And this is another example. Hydrogen cyanide right here is a very prebiotically important uh, component concerning astrophysics that it's seen near stars. It's found in meteorites and cometary material, or there's evidence, experimental evidence of this. And also, it's a byproduct of the milieu chemistry itself. So this is a really good candidate for looking at uh, byproducts of this, which are nucleobases. So this is radically different conditions what you showed earlier. Rather than elevated temperatures, you're actually doing a cold reaction, a frozen reaction, that if you, and we always talk about this in lab, but if you want to do an experiment that no grad student will scoop up and you pick this one, which took 27 years, which is actually a geologically short time period, but it really demonstrates that you form all these other things, and these are all the purines, and again, the red ones are highlighted on the biologically relevant ones, but you get back something like xanthine and hypoxanthine, which are minor bases, and again, this shows up, 2,6-diamino purine shows up in cyanophage DNA. Uh, you don't get the purines, but you also get the pyrimidines again. So uracil, again, shows up in RNA, and you get other things all in here. So again, the question is, you know, can we kind of do the experiments in a lab to kind of probe, you know, the fundamental properties of these nucleobases? So I'm going to go to basically the motivation. And hopefully, I just only gave a few prebiotic reactions done in the laboratory. And there's a whole host of other things and a whole host of different types of nucleobase structures that can be synthesized. So really, there's this clutter.